Hey guys, this is Fredjack Dave. I'm here. We're ready for another Dark Souls 3 stream. I'll probably be playing for a while. I did start a little bit late today. Um, just because that's how it worked out, and there's nothing going on today. There's no FGC stuff until next weekend. And then I think there's another two weeks off before Capcom Cup. So, for once, after a long and busy year, there's not much going on. <laughs> so, I'm free to do whatever the hell I want, so... That means the stream could go on for a while, if I felt like it. It'll probably just go on the normal length, though. I'm gonna be talking about the film Arrival, which came out yesterday. And I watched it, <laughs> obviously. And why it works, and why it, what makes it interesting. And I'll probably be doing that for the duration of here, so I might also talk about Westworld a little bit. This is the other thing I've been watching. And my brain wants to use Bloodborne controls, so I keep pressing L1 to do transitions. But you press L2 in this game. For weapon skills. Alright, so Arrival, the basic premise of Arrival is that it's first contact with aliens, but it starts out with a different scene than that. It doesn't start out with the aliens, it starts out with introduction of Amy Adams' character. And sort of the entire reason the film works in the way it's presented is because Amy Adams' character always looks exactly the same in every scene. And that's a bit of a red herring. But, uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't bother me at all. And it, usually red herring is like a lazy way to make a twist work. But in this case, it, since it is like exactly the theme of the film, it works perfectly. It's actually pretty brilliant that it works in the first place. Because it's just something that you would expect to never work, ever. <laughs> But it does work. So, in general, the film wants you to believe that time is transient. That's the whole point. Uh, that time has no real beginning or no end. And no perceptible side. If you went backwards through time, you could have the same perception of reality that you have if you went forwards. Um, which is basically Nietzsche's infinite cycle in a different way. It's not exactly Nietzsche's infinite cycle. It's a similar concept. Um... Which I don't have any problem with, personally, but for whatever reason, this... The way they constructed the film... It's directed by Dennis Villanueva, who directed Prisoners and Sicario last year. Sicario is one of the best films of last year, of course. But, uh, like, there is a ton of foreshadowing in the movie, <clears throat> and I'm usually someone that picks up on foreshadowing even if it's, like, semi-non-intentional. And I just have seen enough movies to where I understand how every plot arc basically goes. But for some reason in this movie it worked. It worked for me. It, but the reason why it works is because of the red herring, which is Amy Adams' age, which never changes. Um, obviously, if, if 20 years passed, she would look somewhat different, most likely. And Amy Adams isn't, like, exactly the ageless beauty that always looks the same or anything. She's just a normal-looking woman. But, uh, I think that actually aids to it. <laughs> so if you believe that time is transient, then you're also willing to accept that Amy Adams never ages. And this concept makes it work functionally. And that, that's sort of how the entire plot functions. The, the plot would not function without that constraint. Even though it is a rather obvious red herring if you look at it in retrospect. I'm sure some people just uh, didn't get immersed in the movie at all. And if you're not immersed in it, I'm sure it's very obvious from like the first time they say it. The film directly tells you exactly what the twist is like an hour before the twist happens or like 45 minutes before it happens. And it pretty much says it verbatim. 
So, uh, how many people would perceive that? Is the question. Or how many people would uh, conceive the idea that time is transient in the first place? Uh, I think the film generally works if you haven't considered that philosophical argument before. But if you have, I'm not really sure why it does work. But I could safely say that it does. And it's kind of amazing that it does. Another way to look at the film is that it's like The Prestige. The Prestige is basically a movie with a, a ridiculous shitload of foreshadowing. Uh, implying the ending before it ever happens. And some of it is elegant, some of it's really obvious. Um, but uh, it's, it's just a brilliant case of how to use foreshadowing in a film. But in that case, I, I figured out the ending like 45 minutes before it happened. Um, but in the case of Arrival, I did not, even though I've watched many more movies since then, probably almost twice as many, or more, since I've pretty much done nothing but watch movies. <laughs> That's like my one functional connection to society, is seeing every good movie that comes out. Uh, and I just have a really good handle on how films are constructed and so on. Like, I don't really have that much desire to be a director or anything like that, because it's very impossible to succeed in that field, unless you have, like, a shitload of assistance. Which is similar to almost every other field, so that's no great harm on, <laughs> on directing specifically. But, uh, I could do it because I just understand how how films are constructed and how they work, essentially. That was kind of cool that the fire went up the wall back there. Didn't know that could happen. But usually when a film uses a red herring, especially an obvious one, it's like an immediate sign of bad direction and bad plot construction and so on. But in this case, it's it's like utterly brilliant somehow. <laughs> and I'm still struggling with how, why does it work? It might work because I understand the theory and I understood the theory going in. If I didn't, maybe it wouldn't work, but uh, it doesn't seem to be the general consensus considering the ridiculously successful critical and audience reviews. And this is for a film that has practically no violence, has no sex, has nothing, it's just here's, we're making contact with these aliens and we're trying to learn how to speak to them. That's the movie. It's a very peaceful first contact type movie with almost the same uh, plot constraints where the thing that causes a sense of urgency is virtually identical in either film, which is say humans being it is. Um, but the ending in con Contact, which I believe that's the name of the movie, the Jodie Foster 19, early 1990s movie. The ending in Contact is like super lame and cheesy. It's, it's kind of okay if you just watch it once and whatever, but it's nothing too revelatory. But the ending in this movie just works so damn well, even though they're working under basically the same identical constraints. So I'm... I'm just having trouble understanding why it works so well, other than to acknowledge the brilliance of the director and say this is a better film than The Prestige. I think The Prestige is like a top 20 film all time. And this one is probably better than that. So that's pretty damn extraordinary. Conversely, uh, the show Westworld, which I've been watching on HBO, there is no way that Westworld is ever going to come to a satisfying conclusion. Um, maybe it'll it'll be somewhat satisfying, I suppose, but it's not going to be like, oh, it all made sense. It wasn't some bullshit cooked up by J.J. Abrams and his weird uh, TV show plotlines, which basically every J.J. Abrams TV show is a piece of shit in the end. But really interesting, like midway through, up until midway through, until you realize they're just kind of wandering aimlessly. Now, Jonathan Nolan is mostly who's behind Westworld, and Jonathan Nolan is certainly a very talented person, so 
I have more respect for him as a TV show person and as a movie creator than J.J. Abrams. Uh, Abrams is good at making action movies. But I still kind of fully expect the plot to have a sort of unsatisfying conclusion. Maybe it won't. Who knows? I guess I'm, I'm open to the chance that it wouldn't be. But it's it's pretty much exactly Heart of Darkness. And Heart of, Heart of Darkness is one of the, the best pieces of literature ever written, I think, in terms of per page value. That's like a 70 page novella. It's probably the best uh, straight up. Most of Shakespeare's stuff is also pretty short and really good. But uh, like Othello is like 400 pages or something. So, or 250 pages. So four times the length of Heart of Darkness and Heart of Darkness is probably a little bit better than Othello. Othello's pretty much the basis of every good villain in every movie ever that has a good villain. So every inspiration for a devil-like person, which is to say a villain that has no obvious motive. The villain isn't motivated by greed or lust for power or anything. He's just there to fuck with you and that's it. <laughs> um, which is what the devil does, or what one conceives the devil of doing. Uh, whether or not you believe in anything. <laughs> The, uh, the concept of the devil, as well as the concept of God, are both very interesting concepts in a literature sense, uh, especially poetically. So, even if you believe the world is some extremely boring, tedious place, you can still believe, or you can still conceive of the notion of a devil or, or a god, an all-powerful being, as it were. Which are, in some sense, are two sides of the same coin. And that's what Iago does in Othello. As well as Anton Chigurh in No Catch for Old Men, or the Joker in The Dark Knight, etc. And there are many other examples. Actually, Heart of Darkness is one of the examples, as it happens. It hurts in Heart of Darkness. Of course, Heart of Darkness was written in the late 19th century, so 1890s. Around the same time as Nietzsche's Infinite Cycle, ironically, as I talked about that earlier. <laughs> and uh, Othello was written like 1550, so that is uh, almost 500 years old at this point. It will be before I'm dead. <laughs> A 500 year old piece of literature that's that influential. Of course, I don't think that much of Macbeth, for example. I think Macbeth is just kind of okay. Uh, but it's hard to dismiss Othello, or King Lear in retrospect, considering how good Ran is. If King Lear can just create that kind of movie er, as an inspiration, it's hard to dismiss it. The Red Dragon is behind us, that's what the noise is. Uh, I did trigger a Visceral on it earlier, but then my weapon decided not to do it, so just kind of had to deal with it. I'm pretty sure you can't fit in the hole. It would be interesting if you could, but that would obviously just be silly. Uh, I should probably go tap the bonfire out here. That seems like a smart thing to do. The red dragon doesn't spawn if you don't go closer to the bridge, so we don't have to worry about that. We are probably going to have to fight some difficult bosses today, and I'm probably going to go do at least the first boss in the DLC. Well, the first boss. The main boss of the DLC, which is Sister Freed. You know, the weapon I'm using. That lady. Scythe lady. Maria 2.0, as it were. Oh, I'm not supposed to go down here, right? dum da dum I guess it doesn't really matter if I do or not, so I just get an extra Sieg Bro for it. Nope. Drink some cranberry juice. Ah. Glorious cranberry juice. But yeah, Westworld is, has super, super good music, really interesting world design, and all the characters are shit. 
There's two characters that don't suck, but they kind of don't suck because the actors are so good. And, like, vastly overqualified for TV. Which is Ed Harris and Anthony Hopkins. Uh, I think if Anthony Hopkins acted a lot, he would still be a top 5 actor overall. Ed Harris is, like, top 10 or so. But obviously much better than most people on TV shows, even HBO. Even in this era where TV shows are pretty solid. Hmm. Like one or two of these shows up in the DLC? I don't really know why. <laughs> Did you just like, let's slap that down here too. Yep, makes sense. Uh, I could have sworn I saved Siegmeier. Did I just buy the armor and forget to go talk to the well? Or did I make it too far in that, uh, that room? I'm pretty sure you have to enter Irithyll before that happens. No, we just haven't gone to the well yet. So I guess that's what we're going to do momentarily. Hmm. Alright, I'll try to progress. If we fail at progressing, then I'll just go save Siegmire. And it might just be part of the Earthel video. Because I'm usually pretty lazy with Dark Souls 3 editing. This knight is very ambitious lately. Like, it chases you out here and stuff. In the initial state of the game, he almost never went beyond the initial room. But, uh, not so anymore. He just dropped a Divine Blessing. That must be a rare ass drop. A rare drop on an enemy that doesn't respawn. No less. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't drop it always. You do get one upstairs, but that's the only one. Um, there are Silver Knights that respawn, but they do not drop Divine Blessings. As a rare drop. So that's interesting. That was a double hit. I'm not sure why we got a double hit. I guess I'll take it. Alright. Uh, I might just want to run past the bigger enemies up here when we get to them. And this dog is still here as well. Fortunately we're getting like, stuck in this banister. But, oh well. Seems like we're okay. Pretty sure the dog is not going to be smart enough to chase us over here. And this was a pretty smooth run of Irithyll. Uh, Irithyll hasn't been going super smoothly lately. It's certainly one of the hardest areas in the game, so it's not really that big of a deal if it doesn't go smoothly, but... Nice and convenient. Not kind of surprised the dog is all the way over there. Is he going to chase us over here too? Yeah, crazy dog yeah. And I'm going to be very careful with this guy up here. Uh, might just not fight him. Okay, that's good. And we're off to the races. Obviously I have to roll twice because the, the second swing does an absurd amount of damage. So. Oh, got the hit on the second we came out of invincibility frames. Doesn't happen very often, but pretty annoying when it does, I guess. And there you go. That was Irithel. I mean, I'll be going to fight Pontiff Sullivan shortly. But we're gonna go talk to Siegmeier. 
which uh, I guess depends on how articulate I am in the following discussion, whether I'll leave that in or not. The interesting thing with Westworld is it uh, uses it uses a comical amount of nudity because it's an HBO show. Every HBO show has to have a comical amount of nudity, no matter what. Um, but most of the nudity actually kind of works in the show, but instead the violence is just really stupid. Almost universally. Um, where most of it's just nonsensical. It does work occasionally, like they do violence played for humor several times. But if you overdo violence for humor, it just becomes sort of shallow and stupid. Oh. I know that voice. Just how long has it been? It's me, Siegfried of Katarina. I'm loath to admit it, but I've been had. Someone's swiped my armor. Did you happen to see it anywhere? I guess we don't have to leave that in just a few incidental comments. And off we go to Sullivan. Yield Sullivan. Not sure what I'm gonna be doing in the DLC, I'll probably just do it at the end. Whenever I feel like not fighting more shit. <laughs> Very articulate night now. Amazing. Church of Yorshka. Uh Oh, we have to go talk to Sigmar, right? So we want to go to Distant Manor first. Must accumulate Siegbrows. Yes. So that'll be like a 25 minute or so video. <laughs> Maybe 20 minute or so video. That's not too bad. Usually it's like 45. It's obviously a little bit shorter because of less dialogue. But oh well. Actually, he gives you essence too. I guess I'm actually gonna oh. thumb through Sigmeyer's dialogue for once. Sorry, if you're watching the stream. Have you heard? Somewhere, hidden right here in Irithil, is a deep dungeon. And even below that, the profaned capital, home of Yorm, the reclusive giant lord. That reminds me, I've a grave promise to keep. Oh, sorry. I'm afraid I've cast a cloud over things. Well, I'm going to have myself a little nap. The only thing to do, really, after a nice toast. <laughs> oh. 
Alrighty. Onwards to Sullivan. 